I mean, if you really know who you are in Christ, you really ought to have a smile on your face every day. Well, I'm teaching you this weekend about who you are in Christ and what that whole thing means because if you look for it, you see many different things in the Bible. We're made righteous in Christ, we're redeemed in Christ, we're justified in Christ. In Christ, we're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. And that can just be some little religious phrase that we don't even pay all that much attention to if we don't dig into it sometimes. And so I say all the time to people that you must know who you are in Christ if you want to be really happy and be yourself and not be manipulated and controlled by other people, not live in the fear of man, not become a people pleaser, then you have to know who you are in Christ. So many Christians don't even really realize really what they have, what their inheritance is in Christ and, and what's really available to them by faith. Really, we should be the happiest people on the planet. How many of you know that? I mean, if you really know who you are in Christ, you really ought to have a smile on your face every day. You ought to be bearing good fruit, not spending your life murmuring and complaining. And you should be bold and courageous and stepping out to do new things and try things that nobody's ever tried before and not be afraid of fa failure. Just live a wonderful, bold, courageous life. And you should definitely be bold in prayer. Go to God boldly and Ask Him for things that sound crazy to you because God would like to do more for you than what you can ever even think or imagine. But one of the things that Satan loves to do is try to diminish you. He wants to shrink us and he wants to make us feel small and little so we never do anything. And actually we find this in several places in the Bible. So let's look at Jeremiah 29 verse 6. And we'll be putting all these scriptures up for you. It's actually good for you to find them in your Bible, but sometimes in a meeting like this, much as I have to say, it's a little difficult to wait for everybody. So let's just look at this. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there. God wants us to multiply. He wants our resources to multiply. He wants us to multiply. And look at that last verse, line, and do not be diminished. Do not be diminished. God doesn't want your finances to be diminished. He doesn't want your mental capacity to be diminished. He does not want your creativity to be diminished. He doesn't want you to be diminished in any way, shape, or form. And don't get into that thinking that when you get older, everything has to diminish. You have to fight that lie from Satan so you don't just kind of... <laughs> now, do, it, does anything change as you get older? Yes, there are some things that change, but you want to be very careful that you don't just decide when you hit about 65 that your life is over and you're not good for anything anymore. Moses didn't even get started till he was 80. <laughs> Amen. I talked to a woman not too long ago, honestly, who I forget now exactly how old she was when this happened. But I mean, I know she was in her 70s, maybe pretty close to 80. And she said she was in a meeting somewhere and, and God spoke to her when she was that old and told her, start me an orphanage in Africa. And she went and did it. Now, you know, most people would just faint in their brain and just think there's no way that I can do that. But we need to be large spirited not let Satan diminish anything in your life. So if there's anything in your life that you feel is beginning to shrink, your energy, your strength, your creativity, your boldness, anything, I want you to shake that off tonight and make a decision that you are a child of God, an inheritor of the kingdom, a joint heir with Jesus Christ, and everything that he bought and purchased with his blood 
you have a right to. You don't have to earn it or deserve it. It is given to you as a free gift by the grace of God. And I would like to encourage you, every time the devil tries to tell you what you're not, you need to say, well, I am a child of God. And I am in Christ, and that is one place you're not, and you're not going to make me feel small. 1 Samuel 17, verse 26. David was a young boy that had a very close relationship with God, and God had a plan for him to be king. And God only knows what all he's got planned for all the different individuals in this room and even your children in your bloodline. God's got a good plan for everybody. And he wants all of us to do great things in our own realm. Great may mean different things to different people, but if you're going to be a parent, be a great parent. If you're going to operate a machine in a factory, then be the best machine operator in that factory that you can be. Whatever you do, you need to do it the best you can do it and do it for the glory of God. Well, David was a shepherd who was going to be king, and I think David felt greatness on the inside of him. And I think if you'll look around for it, you'll feel some greatness on the inside of you. If you'll stop thinking about what everybody else has said about you and find out what God says about you, then you'll begin to get in touch with that greatness that's on the inside of you. And I think David sensed that greatness long before maybe he was ever even anointed to be king or ever even knew for sure what was going to happen. He sensed that greatness. And there was a battle going on. A great giant, Goliath, had come against the, the armies of Israel and they were all cowering and backing down and diminishing and shrinking and not being bold. But it bothered David that they were acting that way and so he wanted to go to the battle line to see what was going on and he asked a question, what would be done for the man who would slay Goliath? Now let's look at 1 Samuel 17, 26. And David said to the men standing by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Now reproach is shame and blame and he's basically saying, you know, it's shameful for us, the children of God, to back down from this giant. If you're going to fulfill your destiny, you've got to be a giant slayer. You can't be defeated by your giants. You have to confront them and face them. Let's go ahead and put it back up again, please. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should deny, de defy the armies of the living God. You can kind of tell by the way David was talking that he was just a little bit stirred up. All right, next verse. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard what he said to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. You see right away there's jealousy there. And he said, why did you come here? Now watch this. With whom have you left those few sheep that you take care of in the wilderness? Now right away we see that he's trying to diminish David and make him feel little and small and that whatever he's doing is so worthless and useless that why should he ever think that he could possibly take down a giant? But David knew who he was in his relationship with God. Jesus had not come yet, but he had a great relationship with God. Let's continue to look at this. Now Eliab begins to accuse him. And you know, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. I know your presumption and the evilness of your heart. I know that you just came down that you might see the battle. And David said, I love this. What have I done now? <laughs> In other words, he was pretty used to that kind of attitude from his brothers. And I can just tell you that if you really want to do anything for God, you might as well get used to people being used by Satan from time to time to come against you, to try to discourage you, and to make you believe that there is no way that you could do anything worth doing. Now, if, you can, if we continue to read there, you would see that as 
Eliab continued to try to stir up David. I love what the Bible says that David did, and I hope that we can learn to do this tonight. It says, and David turned away from Eliab <laughs> and just went on doing what he was doing. And see, that's what we got to learn to do. When we believe that we've got an assignment, or we've got a dream, a goal, a plan, a vision, I mean, I don't care, even if you feel like today's the day you're going to get your house really cleaned up and the devil comes along and starts trying to diminish you and tell you, look at this mess, there is no way you're going to get this done today. <laughs> don't sit down and have a meeting with the devil. <laughs> Turn away from him and say, well, hide and watch because I am going to get it done through Christ who strengthens me. Turn away from the devil. We see Jesus doing this all the time. He would be healing and raising the dead and people would bring bad reports. He was on his way to raise a little girl from the dead and while he was on his way, he stopped to heal another woman and you know, she had been sick and she died in the meantime and now the people all came and said, you know, there's no reason for you to even come because now it's too late, she's already died. And the Bible says Jesus overhearing them but he ignored them. You know, you may hear the devil but you don't have to pay too much attention to him. How silly is it if we can read plainly in the Word of God that the devil is a liar for us to know the devil's talking to us and believe what he says. Well, I'm just so discouraged because the devil is telling me. Makes no sense. Let's look at Judges chapter 6. I want you to see that this diminishment thing is nothing new. Sometimes we get around people that are more educated than us and suddenly we feel diminished. You know, then sometimes we get around people that in the natural seem to be a little more talented than us and all of a sudden we feel diminished and I can tell you if you know who you are in Christ you don't have to feel diminished around anybody because your worth is not in what you do it's in who you are in Christ amen hallelujah in Judges chapter 6 verse 12 the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of fearless courage. <laughs> and Gideon said, oh, sir, if the Lord is with us. I think he just used that really wimpy, whiny voice. <laughs> oh, sir, if the Lord is with us, then why is all this happening to us? God, if you're here, then why do we have such a mess? Why aren't you doing something? And where are all your wonderful works? that our fathers have told us about. Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt, but now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of the enemy. God shows up and says, Gideon, you mighty man of fearless courage. And he says, you got the wrong guy. We got all these problems. We don't know where God's at. He's not doing anything. Well, God ignored him, and in verse 14, it says, The Lord turned to him and said, Go in this your might, and you shall save Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? <laughs> and and uh, Gideon said, Oh, Lord, how can I deliver Israel? Behold, my clan is the poorest, and I am the least. Are you seeing that spirit of diminishment? And I am the least in my father's house. You got the wrong guy. I'm the kid that had the learning disability. You, you got the wrong person to speak for you, Jesus. I barely passed English. And that's true. I got a D in English. I could have got an A plus in talking, but they didn't have that class. But I got a D in English. Martin, didn't you say you failed music or you almost failed? Yeah, Martin Smith, who led us in worship tonight, failed music in school. <laughs> so you have some fearless leaders tonight. He did the singing and failed music. I'm doing the speaking and failed English. I think God has got such a sense of humor. It's amazing. I mean, my gosh. God recycles trash. He takes what the world would throw away 
and says, you mighty man of courage, I've anointed you, I've called you, I've put my spirit in you, I've given you wisdom, go do something great. And the devil comes along and says, ha, you? And if you knew the mess that I was in when God called me to this ministry, it amazes me what God will do if you will just keep putting one foot in front of the other one and just refuse to give up. Just one foot in front of the other one, one foot in front of the other one, and just say, devil, I'm not going to quit. I don't care if I failed music, I'm called to be a worship leader. I don't care if I failed English, I may not say it all right, but I can say it because I've got a gift of communication from God. Don't let anybody diminish you. Do you hear me? Do you ever feel that, that small thing coming on you, that shrinking? I remember the first time I went out to, first time I got an opportunity to speak in a meeting of any size, and you know, I'd been waiting a long time, so I was pretty excited. And I was supposed to go to Colorado, and actually I got two speaking engagements at the same time, so I was like, oh, wow. I mean, you know, this has been like 28 years ago, I guess. And uh, I was supposed to speak with a, a speaker who was very well known at the time. And I mean, like everybody knew him. He was a big name speaker and he was going to speak and I was going to speak. So I'm like, this is really cool because he'll bring the crowd in and I'll just get to speak. Well, then I was supposed to go from there to Florida where I was going to speak in another ladies conference and that was just kind of a somebody canceled at the last minute and somebody knew somebody that knew somebody that knew somebody that knew me and they were kind of desperate so they invited me because <laughs> nobody knew me you know and I was just going to do a workshop not be part of the main session so you got to you got to kind of think this through and I see I'm full of vision and you know people have been telling me you're crazy and you know I'm losing friends because I'm a woman out trying to do this I've gotten asked to leave my church and so I mean I, I'm fighting the devil fighting the devil see so now these two speaking engagements come in I'd only been doing like a Bible study in my home up until then, trying to be faithful, just not despise the day of small beginnings. And so, uh, went to Colorado, all excited about speaking with this guy. Something happened and he had to cancel at the last minute. Well, people heard that he had canceled and I can tell you they didn't show up for me. So I just had a few people and I was so discouraged when I left there. So now you can imagine the devil is screaming in both of my ears, who do you think you are? You've had a failure. Now you're going to go down to Florida and nobody is going to come to your workshop and you are going to feel like a fool again. Has anybody ever been where I'm talking about? All right. So they called me up. Uh, there was a speakers all sitting on the front row. That was my first opportunity to get to sit with all the big shots, you know. So there we are, there's Dr. So-and-so, Bishop So-and-so, Reverend So-and-so, Bishop So-and-so, Dr. So-and-so, Reverend So-and-so, and Joyce from Fenton. <laughs> and you know, I just felt like I had this big sign on my head with light bulbs going, Joyce from nowhere, Joyce from nowhere, Joyce from nowhere. <laughs> I didn't have any title, didn't have any big name, and so, it was time for me to get up and they wanted all the workshop speakers to tell what their workshop was going to be about the next day to encourage people to come. And I was so scared, so frightened that when I stood up there and I looked at doctor and reverend and bishop and so on and so forth, and I looked at, there was 900 people there that night, I remember. I mean, it looked like 9 million to me. And I was so scared. I mean, I felt like I had to go to the bathroom. I was itching. My heart was pounding. I was thirsty. And I was so scared. If you can believe this, I opened my mouth to tell them what my workshop was going to be about. And my, all I got out was a squeak. <laughs> my mouth was so dry that I just went, Tum up. <laughs> well, so now I'm getting smaller by the moment. And I'm feeling like I could just disappear into the carpet and go away and never come back. I'll never forget that feeling. And right there in the midst of that attack of smallness and diminishment and littleness, I had to make a decision. Either God called me to do this and he put me in that place 
and he was going to make it work or I might as well just go ahead and make a total complete fool out of myself and find out one way or the other. Are you there? Yeah. If it was God or not. Thankfully, the next time I opened my mouth, something good came out and I shared about what was going to be in my workshop the next day. And of course, the next morning, the devil spent the whole morning telling me nobody's going to come, but he's a liar. And we got there and there were so many people in my workshop, they couldn't get them all in. They were hanging out in the halls and hanging in the doors. And they heard what I had to say and went out to our resource table and bought everything on it. And I think they would have bought the tablecloth if they would have sold it to them. And it was a great victory, and you will have victories too if you will not let the enemy continue to convince you that you are nothing. You say, I am a child of God, and I am in Christ, and I will do what God said I will do, and I will be what He says I am, and I will have what He says I can have. You better learn to talk back to the devil. Amen? Come on, I want you guys to leave here large-spirited tonight. I want you to leave thinking, boy, the devil don't know who he's messing with. If God is on my side, whom shall I fear? Exodus 3, 19, let's take a look at Moses. The enemy was trying to diminish him too. You have to realize that every great man or woman of God has gone through this. And when I say great men or women of God, you don't have to be in a pulpit to be a great man or woman of God. Matter of fact, I'd venture to say there's probably more great men and women of God that aren't preachers than those that are. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Uh, Exodus 3, starting in verse 19. And I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless forced to do so. No, not by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand, God says, and I will smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in it. And after that, then the king will let you go. And I will give this people favor and respect in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be that when you go, you shall not go empty handed. But every woman, I love this. Every woman shall insistently solicit of her neighbor and of her that may be residing at her house jewels and articles of silver and gold. See, that shows the convincing power of a woman. God didn't send the men to go get the stuff. He sent the women. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. And you shall take it and put it on your sons and daughters. I like this. And you shall strip the Egyptians of the belongings that are due you. God said, I'm calling you out of that place of bondage. And not only that, I want you to take away all the good stuff from the enemy. And I want you to put it on. And I want you to enjoy it because it's my children that ought to have it anyway. Yeah. Hallelujah. And Moses answered... <laughs> but behold they're not going to believe me <laughs> they're not going to listen to me they're not going to obey my voice for they will say <laughs> oh Moses the Lord has not appeared to you can you imagine how tired God gets <laughs> of trying to find somebody that will just have enough guts and courage to step out into the unknown and be willing, if need be, to be wrong in order to find out if they could possibly be right. Don't live your whole life afraid that you might be wrong. Just step out and find out. Well, I think it's very, very important that we really know who we are in Christ. If you feel diminished in any part of your life, just remember that you're a child of God. Philippians 4.13 says it best, I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I'm ready for anything and equal to anything through Him who infuses inner strength into me. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. So really, apart from Him, we have nothing and are nothing, but through Him and in Him, we really are amazing creatures.
that God has created for His glory. But I know that I know that I know that the Word of God is true and that He changes lives and He gives you a life worth living. Misschien ken je Joyce Meyer van haar boeken of van haar programma Enjoying Everyday Life. Maar wist je dat Joyce Meyer Ministries ook overal ter wereld concrete humanitaire hulp biedt? Door middel van voedselverstrekking, ziekenhuizen, noodhulp bij rampen, het bevrijden van slachtoffers van mensenhandel en nog veel meer. Deze christelijke hulporganisatie heet Hand of Hope en draait volledig op giften. Early on, mom and dad, you know, really just started to realize just how full the Bible is with uh, mandates that we're supposed to take care of the poor. You know, it talks all the time about visiting those that are in prison and feeding the hungry and you know taking in the stranger and, and taking care of the widow and the orphan. And so we strive to do that. And as the ministry has grown, our, our ability to influence and do bigger things has also grown. You know, as we travel around the world, we meet so many wonderful children that have had such desperate need in their life. And we're so grateful to be able to help them. Today, we happen to be in Thailand. And this little boy's name is Somded. And he's had some tragic things in his life, but thank God, through your help, he's now living in the children's home here, and his life is looking very bright. His parents both died when he was six in an auto accident. And when they found him to bring him here to the home, he had had severe ear infections, which had caused hearing loss and lots of other problems in his ears. So he's had about two years of medical treatment on his ears, and thank God he can hear fine now. And so thank you for helping us provide homes for some dead and for other little boys and girls like him all around the world. Over Jezus vertellen en mensen laten zien dat God van ze houdt. Ja, de vele noden op de wereld gaan de mens te boven. En misschien vraag je jezelf af of je er überhaupt wel iets aan kunt doen. Maar dat kan dus wel degelijk. Hand of Hope, de christelijke hulporganisatie van Joyce Meyer Ministries, is daar het bewijs van. Alles in één keer oplossen gaat niet. Maar wij bieden mensen één voor één de helpende hand. De muziekleraar van Beethoven noemde hem een hopeloze componist. Een krant ontsloeg Walt Disney met het argument dat het hem zou ontbreken aan creativiteit. Albert Einstein werd door zijn leraar als geestelijk achtergebleven bestempeld. Well, you know, you have greatness on the inside of you too. And no matter how many challenges you have in life, I'm here to tell you, don't you ever give up. De New York Times bestseller schrijfster Joyce Meyer zal je inspireren om ondanks moeilijke levensomstandigheden sterk te blijven. Bestel nu het boek Geef Nooit Op via onze website joy-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Ga ook eens naar de Facebookpagina van Joyce Meyer Nederland. Like deze pagina en ontvang elke dag inspirerende uitspraken van Joyce op jouw Facebook. Open, direct en to the point. Kleine oases in je dagelijks leven. Lees mee, het is het waard. Alleen bij Joyce Meyer Nederland op Facebook.